Thanks so much. Thanks. All right. Thank you so much, Sandra, and thanks, Tong, for inviting me. What a, what a pleasure. I did get to come to Hicks a couple years ago and had a chance to scan through all of the literature. It was one of the projects that Tong had me do to get a sense of what Hicks was doing. And so I had a chance to go through and find all the I'm not going to call BS on any of it, don't worry, um, on the, the Hicks stuff. Actually, I will mention a few things, but it's my stuff, my own stuff that I, I, I get in trouble with um, as well. So what I want to do is just start with um, something that's real and something that's not. So this is a project that my, my uh, colleague Carl Bergstrom and I released earlier last year to bring public uh, awareness to a lot of the GAN, the, the GAN technology, the deep fake technology that's sort of in front of us right now. So raise your hand if you think the image on the left is real. OK? Raise your hand if you think the image on the right is real. About 50%, not quite. Maybe more people, on the, uh, people think the one on the left is real. Well, the minority won this one. The one on the right is real. The one on the left is computer generated. And we can generate those in minutes, sometimes now even seconds and they are all over the internet. But there's other forms of information. And, oh, and by the way, if you haven't been reading just the news in the last couple days, there's been a lot of discussion right now around ByteDance, who's the parent company for TikTok, which is now integrating some of this um, face swap technology. Um, and we should probably be having discussions about this right now if you care about privacy. But there are other forms of information that can be just as damaging especially if it comes out of venues that appear to look sciency. So right here, this is published in the Journal of Organic Systems. Never really heard of Organ Journal of Organic Systems, did do some looking. But the claim here in the article, and here's the main figure, is that there is this correlation and possibly this link between glyphosate and thyroid cancer. So Roundup, essentially, and thyroid cancer. Now, that may be true, and, and we should be looking very carefully, and people are across the world, about the effects, the health effects of Roundup. But there are problems with this particular figure. Look at it just for a second before I sort of give away at least my issues with it. First of all, as I tell my students, if you allow me to manipulate the x and y axes in any way I can, I can tell any story I want. And I think most of the people in this room know that. The public doesn't, but I do find even in the world of science we make these mistakes too. There's also this curious origin, at least for the y axis, at negative 10. Now you can, you can create this trace, you can make the story, and this particular article has been cited many times. But if you allow me to do the, use the same kind of tricks and I plot, let's say, cell phone usage over time since the mid-1990s, I could write a story that claims that cell phone usage causes thyroid cancer. Some maybe make that claim. I could also make the claim that cell phone usage causes Roundup usage. Now that's a problem. And so it's these kinds of things that we try to look for in our lab. Both automatically, we're developing technology to do this on figures using computer vision, but also in an education form. Now, this conference is a technology conference. It's, a, it's sort of very close to my heart as a, a researcher. I've just been living sort of outside of this community for most of my research career. The rise of the internet and the social web has brought great value to society. It's amplified diverse voices. It's, in, it's enhanced collective action. I wouldn't go back to the world before, even though there are all sorts of calls of a crisis, and there is a crisis of misinformation and disinformation, but we've been through it before. The problem is the new kinds of environments, the new kinds of ways in which we communicate have created it, it created uh, environments that make it easier and easier for misinformation and disinformation to spread. And I truly think it's one of the most pressing problems of our time. It's hard to solve climate change, human health issues, population health issues, planetary health issues, if we don't get the information part right. And I think not just Hicks, but all communities can and should be engaging. I mean, there's been lots of research over the last couple of years. It's something I track on a daily basis in my lab and in this new center. 
One of the big you know, take homes, even though this isn't a great graph, but it's a very commonly cited graph that Craig Silverman did, and it was good work. The graph isn't so good, because you, you know, if you put three points, any line, you, know, you can make a line pretty easily with three points. But the point here is that there is this engagement with fake news at a degree that should be concerning to researchers and the public. Now, we should put some of the onus of the responsibility on the users themselves, the consumers of information, this study show, said uh, from, from the Science Post that 70% of Facebook users only read the headline, like many of us, right, and share. The problem is, with this particular story, if you clicked uh, actually one of those rare, rare individuals that reads papers and reads stories beyond the headlines, you would have found random text on this particular one. And that was a snapshot when I first saw this early on if you look at this, the number of shares, it's gone way, way up. Now, it could be that people are sharing because they find it funny. I still think many of us are getting caught even within the little joke. But science is different, right? All of us that come to Maui, come to these conferences, our field, of course, is different than the rest of the world. We're different than the rest of science. Well, it's something I've been studying, spending a lot of time over the last several years thinking about. When I was young, I really, when I thought about science and I thought about research, I thought about these epistemically pure individuals being driven by the curiosity of the problem. But I soon learned that we're human. We're epistemically solely. Humans run science, humans run research, and that has led and, and been a real route to some of the real reproducibility crisis. So when we talk about misinformation in society, and you see it in the news almost every single day, we also have that issue in science and research, and we need to figure this out. Um, and you know, sometimes it's blown out of proportion, but this is also what the public's seeing. It's a real problem, but it's also what the public's seeing, and that's concerning. Psychology has been hit the hardest. Some of you are in psychology and know this better than I do, but there's been a lot of efforts to the credit of psychology. There's been millions and millions of dollars spent on reproducing research. This was one of the most high profile ones. Out of a hundred of the most important, or some will say most cited studies in psychology, sort of these standard, the top hundred standard studies, guess how many they reproduced? 39 out of a hundred. Now we can make an argument that that's higher than it should be. I think you can also make an argument that we should at least be talking about the systemic issues within science and research and how we generate knowledge that spreads to the public before we even go out to society and point fingers. But it's just in psychology, right? The problem is the unspoken rule is about 50% in even the top venues, science, PNAS, nature, and cell, cannot be reproduced in industrial labs. Now that needs to be confirmed. These are, these, this is more speculation. There's a lot of work going on um, at the Open Science uh, Center and, and various other places, like Brian, Brian Nosak's work, um, and, and, other, and lots of other people working in this space. Now, the economists always think, and I know there's some economists out there, I work with a lot of economists, so I can make fun of them because they make fun of me all the time, but they always think they're doing it better. But some work recently in economics has shown some of the same kind of dire, or not dire, let's just say, uh, numbers that are hard to communicate to the public. In this case, it was around the third when they didn't contact the author of reproducing. And my favorite chart, actually, with this particular study was that they didn't just report their results, they reported them relative to the psychologists. They said, you know, we're not doing so well, but hey, we're doing better than those psychologists. <laughs> you can see here the blue and the orange there, the blue is the psychologist, so they're not doing as well, but that doesn't say a lot. Um, also, in science, we communicate on Twitter. I hate to admit it, but Twitter and other forms of social media is becoming more and more prevalent for sharing frontier results, for, for sharing results at the cutting edge to hear what's going on. And these kinds of things get spread all the time. Now, I study gender in science, and I know there's a problem. And I became victim of the confirmation bias that I tell my students to watch out for. So this was the tweet right here. It says, shocked by differences in words for male versus female recommendation letters for faculty positions. I've read papers and I've been a part of some of these studies that show that there are significant differences. The problem is, with this particular study, if you actually dig to the paper, again, we don't have a lot of time to do these kinds of things, but we probably should. If you look at the study, it said the exact opposite, yet this was the thing that was going viral 
across the world. This last tweet here was going viral. And this is what the paper said. Overall, the results of the current study revealed more similarity in the letters written for male and female job candidates than differences. So what was wrong? Does anyone have an idea? Think about it for a second. What was happening, and I was victim of it, I do these examples just so I show that I'm also uh, uh, susceptible to making mistakes. The image that my friend tweeted was illustrating the hypothesis, not the results. The standout words, there were, it was almost a too good to be true kind of story. The standout words were what they were testing against these grindstone words. That's what spread and that's what sort of caused this uproar. So we're victim of this in science as well. So what's going on? Is it fraud in science? We talk a lot about deep fakes and, and, and misinformation and fake news, but it's been around like everyone knows for a very, very long time. I have, I have, uh, we have lots and lots of examples of really old um, fraudulent fake news kinds of examples in science. This is, this is a, one of uh, my more recent favorites. So William Charlton actually um, painted a brimstone butterfly, sent it in to the London Museum School, and every, it caused this uproar. Wow, we found a new butterfly. No one had ever seen it. It has these sort of half moon shapes on the right here. Carl Linnaeus saw it. He was convinced. He gave it a name. I can't pronounce it very well. It's like Palinto, Eclipsis with the half moons. It was put officially in the books. So is it this what's driving the problem in science? Actually, I don't think it is. I think it's a very small percentage. It does happen, but it's a small percentage. It has to do more with the kinds of things that we're seeing. P-hacking, outcome switching, harking, uncorrected multiple comparisons. One of the biggest changes I think that's going on in many fields, and I'd love to see it in Hicks, is pre-registering experiments. It's really changed some of the fields that we're working on. When I think of all the changes in the last 10 years, that's one of the, one of the most important. A lot of it has to do with this file drawer effect, the publication bias. We get promoted, we get funding when we publish things that have that arbitrary p-value of less than 0.05 and we put the rest of them in the file drawer. This leads to publication bias where people preferentially report journals that, pu prefer that preferentially publish positive results. Now I could give a whole lecture on this, something I care deeply about and there's a lot of people working on this right now, but I want to give you my favorite paper on this that demonstrates the seriousness of it. So Eric Turner was one of these few individuals that was working at the FDA and had to see those experiments that were done no matter what the result. They had to pre-register. This was pre-registration before pre-registration. They're still doing it. And what they did is they wanted to look at antidepressant drugs and they wanted to see their effectiveness. Now this is what the world saw in terms of effectiveness of these antidepressants. So you see... Um, you see the, uh, at the top the positive results for each one of these antidepressants. That's what you would have seen in the publication world, which is very much similar to much of what we see in the literature. But Eric Turner had a different view because he was at the FDA. You want to see what he saw? This is what he saw. Not positive. There were outcome switching, all sorts of different things. And this is for just one small snapshot of a unique situation when this data was housed. And so we do have to think about how to address it. There's lots of good things, uh, lots of good suggestions, and there are things going on in different fields. But hopefully, again, Hicks can be a leader in this. Now, another thing that we've been looking about in our lab is the role that technology is playing on science and what we do as researchers. So one of the things we looked at recently, we looked at the impact that search engine recommender systems have on science, essentially the Google Scholar effect. Are we only just looking at those top 10 that come, those top 10 results, citing those? The search engines then push those up higher in the rankings and therefore accelerate the Matthew effect? It's a pretty simple thing to measure. Well, well it's never, never simple. But one of the things you can do, and it's been looked at by James Evans and Vincent Lavier, which they got totally different results, they looked at the literature over the digital transition. And they wanted to know is the, the citation distribution to papers, if you take all papers and you look where citations land, is it becoming more skewed or is it becoming more diversified due to the ability for papers to be accessible like never before? And you have these search engines that can do all sorts of um, uh, polling of different uh, tales of the distribution. So is it flat or is it skewed? 
Well, we went through, we looked through, I'll just give you the quick take, looking at millions and millions of publications over the last 20 or 30 years, including usage data at major, billions of usage events at major archives like JSTOR, we were able to see that not only is it getting more concentrated, the citations, over this time period, if you look at the citations to the top 5% shares of all papers, over this transition, the transition there is when we started using, approximately using these search engines, these integrated search engines like Google Scholar. It also applies in when we look at dispersion. So dispersion is basically the number of papers that are ever cited. So if you only look at, if you look at papers that at least receive one citation. Turns out, in both cases, it's getting less diverse and more concentrated. But it's even worse, that's within field citations, when we as a community collectively cite papers outside our field, we are even more prone to this technology effect. When we look across fields, if you look at ver on concentration, you see it's even worse for interfield citations. When I cite something out of my field, I go, well, it looks like it's been cited, or it looks like it's in this top journal, or it looks like it's the top 10 that Google Scholar has delivered to me. It gets worse. And in diversity, it's even more extreme. So the point here is that science, some of these issues in, in society where we're talking about technology's effect, social media's effect on the spread of misinformation, disinformation, fake news, propaganda, et cetera, et cetera, we have those issues in science. And I just wanted to make that point in the first part of the talk. But now let's talk about societies. So first of all, Carl Bergstrom, a colleague of mine, we, did, uh, we, were starting, we were seeing this kind of thing in science and in our personal lives and thought, what is the one thing we can do? We can't, you know, we can develop, try to develop technology. We can try to talk to our local policymakers, but none of those kind of seemed like the right thing. We were teachers, so we wanted to teach the public and teach our students how to be able to call BS when they could. Now, we have a non-swear word version, too. Um, that I have a script that strips all the swear words out. Um, that you can go to if you want to share it with high school students. Um, but here's our central philosophy. Um, the central philosophy here is that you don't need to have a PhD in statistics or computer science to call BS on, uh, on the, ki the, the kind of information that gets wrapped in statistics, computer algorithms, et cetera. It's there where we really, uh, that's where our specialization, we specialize um, in the class. We feel that if you just concentrate on the data, ignore really the black box, and then also concentrate on the output interpretation, you'll get a long way. So let me, ex I'll give you some examples. So it did sort of go viral and that was fun. It is being taught at over 100 universities around the world. So that's been exciting. These are the kind of topics I'm, I was just gonna uh, do a little bit of sampling for the rest of the talk and sort of integrate it into the things that we're seeing in society, um, but also sort of bring it back to this science issue. So we do spend a lot of our time, both on the research side and the teaching, talking about misinformation, disinformation. We talk a lot about sort of data. We call it big data still because a lot of it's driven by data selection problems. And we do talk a lot about the nature of science. So let me sort of separate the two kinds of BS that we see. We see sort of old school BS and new school BS. The old school BS is something that's been around since we were all learning our first language. This is an example of something that we live in Seattle, so we see a lot of startups. And this is one thing we saw. Our collective mission is to refunctionalize customer-driven solutions for leveraging underutilized portfolio opportunities. Uh, I'm still trying, I've, I, I've shown this example several times, and when I read, I still can't pick up exactly what it means. Um, but we have this new kind of BS here. We have this uh, kind of BS that comes wrapped in Bonferroni corrections and p-values and clinically important, but Un, you know, uh, and uh, uh, paradigm shifting, et cetera. And this is the kind of thing that we focus on in the class because it's numbers nowadays with data, data driven decisions flooding everything, every decision we make. Every company you talk to, every university you talk to, anyone that works in the station, I teach data science classes, I teach machine learning, I teach statistics. And you know, we do see real value in numbers. They're, they seem precise and objective, they seem sciencey. But it also gives them more weight than they deserve. We already know that words are these subjective human constructs. But numbers seem to just sort of drop straight from the sky. They're heavy, and, and they, they carry a lot of weight. And that's why 37% of all keynotes include made-up statistics. Um, 
But words, like if these, we have tons and tons of examples, and we try to always give examples from the left if we use things that are politically tinged and the right. But this, if you read this, without any numbers, you can get a sense of what it's saying, but you know that it has this fuzziness about it. You think the countries are giving us their best people? No, they give us their worst people. But if you're Breitbart and you write down the number 2,139 DACA recipients convicted of or accused of crimes against Americans, that carries more weight. You know, and, and we see this kind of use of numbers on both the left and the right. This isn't uh, on one side or the other. But if you actually looked at the numbers and you put them in context, like we should always do, it turns out that 0.3% of DACA recipients have been convicted of crime. So the number was right. Breitbart wasn't lying about the number. They just didn't provide any context. Compare that to almost 9% of Americans that have been convicted of a felony conviction. Now, these kinds of things are even more subtle especially when they come from data companies that don't have any political alignment. This is Statista, they were selling this data and I, I've shown this example a few times and it's hard to see if it's not really big but I'll just sort of tell you what you're looking at. What it's showing here is uh, sort of a, a supposed leveling off of carbon emissions. But the problem is the x-axis goes from 1751, 1781, you know, it jumps in 30 year increments and then all of a sudden goes 2009, 2010, 2011, 2012, 2013, 2014. And our class is not just about spotting BS and also the research side of what we do on this. It's not just about spotting, it's in the refutation. So one of the most easy t techniques that we can teach the public and the, and the technology that we can develop to make that easy is to replot. So we replot with the, the basic tenant of having even tick marks on the, the x-axis, and you get a very different story with the same exact data. So these are the kinds of things we're looking out for. Now you can see this even in our very top publications. Nature, you know, one of the premier publications in the world, uh, published this, claiming that there's, that women may sprint, clo uh, maybe are closing the gap on men and may one out day, uh, one day overtake them. And that may be true, women may out sprint men, um, but the problem is the argument that was made was discovered, that the problems with the argument that was made was discovered by a high school class in Texas and also a colleague actually at the University of Washington, so that I, I, that's one way that we know about it. And this is what they wrote to Nature. A.J. Tatum and colleagues calculate that women may outsprint men by the middle of the 22nd second. They omit to mention, however, that a far more interesting race should occur in 2636 when times of less than zero seconds be recorded. <laughs> In the intervening 600 years, the authors may wish to address the obvious challenges raised for both timekeeping and the teaching of basic statistics. I love this for various reasons. One, a high school class discovered this, and also a colleague of ours at university. I love that they use sir, that's very nice too. Um, but it was a good way to make a point. It's something we call reductio ad absurdum. And we try to teach these kinds of methods for refutation. And I think in science, we can do a better job than attacking individuals. We attack and have some fun on the argument. All right, so I've been ha we've been talking a lot about this, so what is BS? I can't do a lecture or a talk without at least trying to define it. Well, a lot of it was influenced by readings that I did many years ago, picking up Harry Frankfurt's very famous on, B on bullshit, one of the most salient features as he starts his, his, his little short compendium of our culture is that it, there's so much BS. Everyone knows this, each of us contributes its share, but we tend to take the situation for granted. Here's a, so Carl and I have been thinking a lot about the definition and it evolves as we learn, think more and more about this, but here's our working definition. So as I finish, go through and, and finish through the talk, I want you to be thinking about this and see if, you know, what we got wrong, because I know it's not all right, we've been changing it. But we think it involves language, statistical figures, there's that data part, data graphics, and other forms of presentation, and here's the important part. Intended to impress, overwhelm, or persuade. This is different than a liar, and Harry Frankfurt talked about this. A liar knows the truth and the liar is pushing you away from the truth. A bullshitter doesn't care. They're just trying to impress, grab your attention. That's why I look at like soft, our, our social media platforms or, or platforms in general as some of the biggest bullshitters of all time. They don't care what you read, they want your attention. And we have that both in individuals and we have that in our technology and we need to be on the lookout. So let me just give you one example from someone you might know guy by the name of Sigmund Freud. In his writing, he writes, so I gave my lecture yesterday despite a lack of preparation. I think we all know about this. I spoke quite well and without hesitation. 
Now this one may be a little different, which I ascribed to the cocaine that I had taken beforehand. <laughs> I told about my discoveries in brain anatomy, all very difficult things that the audience certainly didn't understand. All that matters, but all that matters is that they get the impression that I understand it. I think we all understand that point too. But hello everyone, this is exactly within our definition of BS. It's intended here to impress, overwhelm, or persuade, presented with a blatant disregard for actually informing, uh, information actually being conveyed. So now let me to put it to a more serious note here. One of the things I've been doing, living now and more in the computer science world, is I get a chance to read a lot of the current papers that drop out in, in the archive or that you find in the news before they even have been peer reviewed. And there's been this movement that some of my colleagues and I have been calling Phrenology 2.0. Phrenology, for those that aren't uh, familiar with it, it's, this, uh, it's essentially this idea that you can look at the brain and you can tell certain kinds of characteristics of the individual by morphological characters, the cranial shape, etc. And this idea has actually been around for a long time. Cesar Lombroso was one of the fathers of criminology, ended his career thinking he could use morphological characters. It was debunked as pseudoscience about three decades later, but it's come rearing back. Now if you go to our website, we make all our material free. One of the things we go after is one of the papers that you may have known, this, 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 this paper that claimed that you could tell whether someone was a criminal or not by looking at their face. Not that long afterwards, another paper came along and it was written breathlessly in The Economist, which I respect, The Guardian, same kind of thing, New York Times wrote breathlessly why Stanford researchers were trying to create a gaydar machine. The claim in the paper was that they could look at morphological features of your face or image, in this case, and they could tell whether you were gay or not. Now that shunt, that went virally, as I think you can imagine, but it was very, in, in my opinion, in my colleague's opinion, a pretty severe thing, or, or, or something that we should look at pretty severely. So let's go back to this philosophy I'd mentioned that sort of guides much of what we teach and the way that we do research both on the automated form and also just in the education form. So our claim here is that, well I'll start with their claim. Their training data, which is just the data input, you don't have to have a PhD in machine learning to, to try to understand what's going on. They use headshots scraped from dating sites labeled by orientation. We don't get a lot of detail on what it is. We give a few examples I'll show you in just a second. But let's assume that's right. They then use this, off, they call it off-the-shelf computer vision and machine learning. Now, if I had more time, I'll talk about this off-the-shelf kind of um, uh, argument that's made a lot in the, in the literature. But here's the part I want you to ignore. In all the papers, and I've reviewed hundreds of papers in this space, like many of us, very rarely is it in the black box. It can be in the black box, but it's rare. What I want you to do in this example, we're going to walk through this paper, is focus on the output and the interpretation. Here we go. I didn't make these pictures examples. These were in the paper. So which one is more likely to be heterosexual? This is the example that they give. They give this to a machine, and they give it to people on Mechanical Turk. Here we go. So we've got headshots straight from dating sites. That's all we kind of need to know what they did. Now, there are all sorts of problems with that. I don't, normally, we just that's as far as we get in these problems. We only get on the data input. But let's just stop there. Or let's not stop there. Let's keep moving. This was their results. They found that humans could determine the sexual preference of someone at 61%. They could tell, computers could do it at 81%. That's enough for news, right? That's enough for The Economist, The Guardian, The New York Times, etc. cetera. They put, they put one of these composites together showing darker areas or areas that were stronger signatures of uh, someone's sexual preference. Now, and by the way, I mean, this is also putting aside all the other issues around gender and continuums and, and, and not binarizing the idea. There's so many, but, but, I'm, but I'm, all I'm asking you is just to go along with it until we get to the interpretation. They did these composites looking at all their images. They had this four by four quadrant with those that were male and, like, and, and, and the composite of those that, that were heterosexual faces. Um, those that were homosexual faces in both of the genders. I think one of the things you see with the, the composite heterosexual males, it looks like they have goatees in, uh, in these images and they wear a ball cap or something. I think that's about what you get from that. 
But this is what we have so far, and I've even told you, I mean, first of all, we could dig into each one of those, but I want you just to take those and leave those, and we're going to talk about the interpretation. So they trained the model, they got these percentages, we'll just assume that's all right. And this is how it was reported. The findings reported in this work show that our faces contain more information about sexual orientation than can be perceived or interpreted by the human brain. Now that's saying a lot given the high capacity that our brains have for visual perception. I know there's people in this crowd actually that have expertise in this area. Going on in the paper, according to the PHT, this is the prenatal hormone theory, highly controversial. Same gender sexual orientation stems from the underexposure of male fetuses over or overexposure of female fetuses to androgens that are responsible for sexual differentiation. You'll find soon why I'm highlighting that. This was their big conclusion on interpretation. Our results provide strong support for the PHT. Now, I think all of us in here could come up with about 50 different alternative explanations, even if we took the data to be real. Now, I'm not saying they faked the data. I think the data is still real. I just think it's a misinterpretation. So prenatal, prenatal hormone exposure creates facial differences too subtle for humans to detect. That's the conclusion. That's what moves on virally into the news. And that's what's used by governments where it can be punishable by death. So let me use an analogy. We use analogies a lot in our, in our class and, and the work that we do on, and actually we're calling now bullshit studies. Um, I actually put it on my, I'll probably start putting it on my CV, CV more often. Um, I think an analogy helps on this. So Carl, my colleague, and I have been using these kind of analogies. We found this one to be most effective. Since we're talking about computer vision and we're talking essentially about humans not being good at conditional probability, which we think is part of the explanation to this, let's imagine you put a camera over a blackjack table. You, you play enough rounds, the computer and the computer vision technology today would easily outplay humans. But it's not that that camera is seeing some pattern inside those cards. That's the claim here. There's some patterns in the human face that the human mind just can't pick up. It has more to do, well, here's, here's the way you can rephrase those, that exact summary that we had. The findings reported in this work show the backs of playing cards contain more information about suit and rank than can be perceived or interpreted by human brain. That's the argument that at least I'm making here. The issue here isn't about seeing something magical through the cards. It's not about seeing something magical in morphological characters. It could, be, it could be the way that you present yourself and the way you advertise yourself on a dating site or wherever the images, training images came from. But it's much more about this issue of hit or stand. So if you're, if you're playing blackjack and you get a six and you have a jack and a four, do you hit or stand? Some of you are good blackjack tables. What do you do? I'm getting a mix. Uh, I, as far as I know, you stand, you stand on this one, but you know, there's other, if you're counting cards and other things. But the point is, unless you're a well-trained blackjack player, that's hard. Humans aren't good at that. Untrained humans are bad at blackjack, and they're also bad if you're a mechanical Turk or doing this assessment, especially outside the country, not knowing cultural reference, you're also bad at culture. Like, how do you integrate a ball cap? This person has a gold, but then they have you know, trimmed eyebrows, and they have a goatee, but then they are wearing a shirt of some kind. How do, we un how do we do that integrations? So here's the thing that our results provide strong support for the PhD. This, an alternative path is like there's many social aspects of self-preservation, really, and grooming could be better explanations. Naive humans from mechanical Turk are not good at integrating this information to estimate sexual orientation. Now, again, all the discussion I've been having so far had nothing to do with the technology, even though we could dig into the the actual machine learning algorithms that were used, but that this was enough, and we're trying to teach the public, to be able to call BS by using this sort of procedure. And so this is our idea, whether it's a simple data project for uh, you know, an undergraduate or graduate, even us as, uh, as, as researchers in the field, to, to not get overwhelmed by the black box, because that's sometimes um, where we, uh, we sort of stop calling BS when we should. So what I want to do now to end is just sample few, a few of these other topics that I found kind of useful in not just looking through Hicks. I mean, actually, I, was, I, I don't do that because I make mistakes all the time, too. But whether you're at Hicks or any other conference, there are a couple things that have been sort of emerging in the research that m my colleagues and I have been doing in this space, both in science and outside of science. 
And I'm just, I just picked a few favorites. I mean, we have over 60 hours of lecture on this. But here's one of my pet peeves. It's either when we use causal language or prescriptive language when it's not there, and even when we don't use it, like in this study, this study did re was responsible. It was a well-designed observational study that showed only correlation and reports it correctly. Does not make claims. The problem is, it's this marriage of both the researcher and the, the journalist. It's both, they're both at fault. We're all, university press offices are actually the worst. Some of the work that we've been doing is showing how bad the university press offices are in sort of spreading in, uh, misinformation about causal studies when they're not there. So here was the study here. They were very careful in everything they wrote, but it, was, it went viral across the world. You know, Time Magazine, exercise can lower risk. That's causal language. Health Buzz, exercise cuts cancer risk. Huge study finds. Exercise drives down. These are all causal language. And here's the issue. More and more studies are coming out showing how often journalists' accounts of science and research show or, or claim causal language or a causal argument when in fact there's only correlative evidence. And even worse, in my opinion, is that half a third of the actual journal articles and also half of the news articles. It's the journal articles that I'm concerned about more often. So I could talk about that. People that know me, I've talked about, I could talk for five hours about causal. That's our causal claims and, and how we need to be better in science about this. But let me just spend a little more, uh, a few minutes just talking about selection bias. It's one of the easiest things we can do, but it's overlooked so often. So selection bias happens this, the second you land in Maui and you start talking to other tourists and other uh, natives of, of Maui and you ask them, what's the best island in Maui? They say, well, Maui, of course. But you're on Maui, Alan, so how can you, that's the, the, that's the kind of selection bias we fall prey to all the time. It's also why this particular app on mushrooms and it will have a huge survival bias uh, uh, problem. <laughs> and actually, I live in the Northwest in Seattle, and mushrooms can be very dangerous. So yeah, they're, they're, you have to be careful of those. So selection bias is something I think we're all familiar with, but we, it comes rearing its ugly head. I have fallen victim to it many times. For example, um, let's imagine uh, some, some of my colleagues have wanted to look at this, uh, try to assess the state of marriage in the United States um, using some of these uh, markers that can be found, these population level markers like, um, like these uh, autocompletes on Facebook or, or Twitter or Google. And if you went and did this for Facebook and you said, you know, my husband is, you would find, you know, my husband is my best friend, my life, awesome, everything, best quotes, my love. If you did the same assessment on a va uh, also a very big population, Google, you would find this. My husband is mean, addicted to porn, depressed, selfish, the best. Dope. Now, I don't know what kind of dope that is. Which one? That's uh, dope is cool or a, a dummy. Um, so watch out for it. But let me give you a more subtle one. Those are kind of the easier ones to look out for. And I think most of the people in this room are well-trained, but we need to be talking to our students about this. I think it's one of our responsibilities. And, and, and again, I'm, I've been victim of this all the time. There's a whole bunch of other ones that we don't talk enough about to graduate students. Here's one of my favorite recently that I've been finding that students, graduate students, are failing on. So Berkson's paradox, paradox you'll find all over the place once you start looking for it. One example of it was Google's uh, is use of machine learning for hiring. And what they found was interesting. They found that those that scored well on the programming tests in the hiring interviews, they were correlated negatively with job performance. That didn't make a lot of sense, and also when you're trying to do machine learning, you know, all these sort of weird things can pop up. But the hypothesis was that contest winners just program too fast, and, uh, but being slow and careful is better on the job. This, is, this was uh, Peter Norvig's hypothesis, but I think he jumped to the conclusion a little bit too soon on what it is if he was thinking about Berkson's Paradox. How many have ever heard of Berkson's Paradox? Two people, it looks like, in this whole room. These are the kinds of things we've been thinking about. So let me use Jordan Elliburn's explanation of what Berkson's Paradox is. When we're young, it seems, I mean, let, let me be okay. It was Jordan's example, so I can use it however. When we're, we're young and we're dating, well, actually, we could be old and dating too, it seems like those that are hot are not as nice and those that are nice are not as hot. That was the way he used this, uh, he decided to, to explain this example. Again, not my example, but I thought it, it just, it kind of gets at what we're looking for. 
And if you look at the data, I mean, the claim here is that there is, let's assume, no correlation between hotness and being a jerk. The problem is, because we're talking about selection bias and selection effects, we are sort of selecting. We're not, like, for example, we don't want someone who's not hot and is a complete jerk, right? So we can get them out of the population, right? Here we go. They're out of the population. You wouldn't date this group of people. At least I would hope not. They're jerks, and they're not nice, or, or not, uh, they're not hot, or whatever, however you want to look at it. This is why I don't give this example very I have other examples I should give. Um, OK, but here's another, but here's, there's a reverse selection going on, too. It's not just who you would select. Remember, this is a pairing contest, and someone's selecting you as well. So there's also another kind of selection going on here. <laughs> they wouldn't date you. So selecting on multiple traits generates this negative correlation even though there's no negative correlation. Now this is one of these paradoxes that we talk about. I love talking about paradoxes. They're, they're some of the mo my more favorite things to talk about in class because it really trains us to be more aware of these selection effects when we think we're so good at selection effects. So back to Google. Imagine a, you know, also a two-dimensional plot. You look at what really matters and this programming competition score. Now, they're not going to hire anyone that performs really, really poorly. Most of the population aren't good programmers or have never programmed in their life. So as you make that selection, and if you overweight a selection for, pro for programming experience, for example, you can get the same kind of negative correlation when, in fact, there really is nothing in there in the population. So these are the kinds of things we're going to look at. Now, another one that no one ever almost talks about is something that Carl and I call observation selection effects. That's this idea that, you know, when you're, you're driving, you feel like you're always in the slow lane and everyone else is always passing. Because if you're in the slow lane, most, they're going slower and they're the majority of the cars. More cars pack in a slow lane. And so you see this all the time. So we're all, most of us are at universities. I know there's industry representatives here. U.S. News and, uh, ranking is one of those revered rankings that all presidents go after because they really matter a lot for, I was going to say better, mostly for worse. But faculty resources, 20%, most of that is, is run, uh, is pushed by um, teacher to student ratios. So if you took a random school, if you took a Marquette, for example, they're one of the few schools that makes this data available. Carl and I have tried really hard to find examples. This data is not available because I think universities are <laughs> manipulating the data a little bit. Um, uh, so here, this is actual data. You have this class size and the number of classes in each one of those class sizes. So if you were to average, if you were to uh, do the calculation here, the mean class size here is about 26. There's 505 students are in five-person classes, and there's 3,300 students that are in 150 student classes. The average class size is 26, like I said, but here's the key thing. The average experience class size is 51. That matters, because if you went to the students in that school and you said, tell us about the average size of your class, they would never say 26 they would say something closer to 50 because that's their experience class size. That's what US News re should be reporting, but that's not what they're reporting. You ask a random professor, it's 26, average student, and that explains a friendship paradox, which most of you may have heard of, maybe not. It's another one of these fun paradoxes that also has these kinds of selection effects. The idea here with the friendship paradox is that everyone here if you took everyone in the population, and, and this has been calculated, Johan Uganda did this uh, on, with Facebook data, you have fewer friends than the mean number of friends that your friends have. Sounds kind of strange, right? How could that possibly be? You have fewer friends than the mean number of friends that your friends have. That's the weak friendship paradox. So this is our little calling BS, and I was just going to explain why that actually is the case. Because all I need to do is be a friend with Rihanna, 95 million followers, and I immediately will have less because we take the 95 million followers divided by our followers. We have about, I'd need, you know, 33,000 followers to not be in this 93% group of Facebook users in the same boat. But it's not the weak friendship paradox that I want you to think about. It's the strong friendship paradox. This now will bend your mind. If it doesn't, then think about it a little bit deeper. You have friends that the median number of friends have. So it, it doesn't necessarily hold on this Twitter example for us, but it does hold for 84% of Facebook users. So it's the mean this time, or the median, not the mean. 
Now, the strong friendship paradox, this is our sort of explanation. An introvert with 10 friends makes 10 friends feel better, but a socialite with 1,000 friends makes 1,000 people feel insecure. Now, you're not going to like to hear this, but this also applies to the heart. So your sexual partner most likely has more sexual partners. And OK, we'll, we'll skip that one for now. <laughs> All right. OK, I want to end here with just the other way in which we talk with data and where misinformation rises. Believe it or not, the rise of the chart in newspaper and even in science publications is relatively recent, given the, for, the way that we've communicated as a human species for a long time. This rise has given a need to teach the public how to digest charts better. Now, we chart everything nowadays, ridiculously. This is sort of the sophistication we have, you know, in 2020. Now we chart these kinds of things, and that's unnecessary. But here's the more serious thing. Most American adults, and I imagine this is the case around the world, cannot correctly read this particular chart. Look at it for a second. Average sugar consumption, average number of decayed teeth per person in different countries. 63%. This kind of study has been done over and over. This should be alarming. If we are presenting data in every form, in newspapers, in reports, in government documents, and most of the, the, the public is having a hard time reading charts and interpreting them, we need to do a better job. The answer, by the way, is that more sugar people eat, the more likely they are to get cavities. That also allows tech leaders, government leaders, professors to get away with things like this. So Tim Cook, when he took over, he was talking about you know, this, this, you know, this uh, massive over uh, taking over of iPhones. Uh, the sales are going up. But as I tell the students, as far as I know, cumulative charts always go up. And if you looked at this differently, if you looked at quarter results, he didn't want you to see quarterly results, I imagine. So we want the public to be out looking, looking for these kinds of things. It's also why this is the, you know, according to the National Review, this is the only global warming chart you'll ever need to see from now on. Now, this is real data. They zoomed out far enough, and it's a flat line. What do we have to worry about, right? Now, of course, if you zoom in, you see that two-degree difference, which does matter from an ecological perspective. But my favorite reductio uh, uh, ad absurdum for this example was plotting time on both the x-axis and the y-axis and writing an article proving that time doesn't march forward. So that was a favorite of mine. Now let me just mention one thing. If I had time, I'd talk about mathiness. It's, my, it's our new term that I'm having a lot of fun with um, just because I see mathiness all the time. But there's mathiness of data viz, which I haven't mentioned much. And I just want to say a couple, a couple examples, and then I'm done. There are beautiful visualizations that have been designed by scientists and designers over the ages. Some of the most beautiful are the periodic table, the subway map, phylogenies, the, these Venn diagrams, really beautiful, precise pieces of, of information conveyance that tell you something. The periodic table, the position tells you something. It allows you to make predictions. But they're totally misused in so many different ways. We now have the periodic table of typefaces, the periodic table of data science, the periodic table of visualization methods, alcohol. I mean, at least the alcohol one is reasonable. I mean, you can maybe make predictions there. Um, they're all over the place. I could go on. I mean, Carl and I give entire lectures just on this stuff. They take these beautiful reconstructions of form and function and then turn it into things like this. This is the Analytics Accelerator Award. You have the analytic thinker in the head, as you can see. There's statistics. There's uh, programming and Python skills. And then look at the, the tail, not kind of near the, the bum. I, I don't know if that was like the, the designers having uh, uh, an argument with the business group, but the business acumen being in the tail was quite funny uh, when I saw that. But it's also these Venn diagrams. Politicians do this all the time. Scientists do it too, but politicians are the worst. Here's Hillary Clinton to Congress. 90% of Americans supported universal gun drug checks, 83% of gun, I mean, they just, they, you, you, it, your brain just explodes trying to exp understand what's going on. Here was, uh, I have uh, Romney and, and Obama and all of them, they, and, and actually, you know, like I said, I try to do make ex uh, examples from left and right. I mean, this, this particular one, China and the US matching pace, makes no sense. But here's one of my favorite, from a major company, information company, Thomson Reuters, via the Washington Post. <laughs> Trust, partnership, innovation, performance, our values. <laughs> Woo! 
And they're the company we should be trusting. All right, okay. So let me just end here with a couple thoughts. I started with this excitement that we're living in right now as a human species. The rise of the internet and social media has really, it really has delivered so many gifts to the world. But there is a lot of things that we gotta be serious about. And I think Hicks is the place to be thinking about these problems. If anyone wants to talk about the research, we're, we're like, uh, like Sandra had said, it was a beautiful introduction. We, are start, we have started this new Center for an Informed Public. We were given uh, $5 million of seed money from Knight Foundation and several other foundations are, are, are chipping in. We want to, it's a research center at its core, but it has a huge public engagement um, uh, arm to it. So just as an example, on January 23rd, in a couple weeks, we're going town hall on the road in our state. We're starting in Seattle, and then we're going to rural communities, and we're talking to, uh, to the people about the challenges they have around misinformation and how it impacts democratic discourse. We've had some unsolicited editorials, and I really appreciate it, but I think we might be careful, want to be careful in sensationalizing it. They claim that we're going to save democracy. I don't think that's quite what we can do. And so we need to be careful also not to make the problem worse. It's one of the things that concerns me a lot about studying misinformation, disinformation. The more we talk about it to the public, the more we may be adding to the problem because it causes distrust in institutions. And people that are a part of disinformation campaigns, that's exactly what they want. So we need to be careful about the way that we talk about it, but we do need to be talking about it. And, and here's one of my favorite quotes, historical quotes. Of of, of an age that also is, went through what we're going through now in this transition, this information transition. If you, well, first I'll read the quote. Writing indeed, which brings this in gold, in gold for us, should be respected and held to be nobler than all goods unless she has suffered degradation in the brothel of the printing press. They were worried that anyone can consume information, anyone can produce it, just like now, but we got through it. We would never take away the printing press. So I think we can get there, but we do need to take it serious. And as I started the whole talk with, one of the most important bullshit laws that Neil Postman talked about half a century ago was that at any given time, the chief source of bullshit with what we have to contend is ourself, our own organizations. Let's get that cleaned up and then hopefully make impact on the rest of the world. Thanks for listening. Happy to take any questions. Yes, thank you. Thank you.